Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming to today's talk. Uh, my name is Shahin Atakshir, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Computing Science. Uh, I am a member of Explainable AI Lab uh, and uh, led by Professor Randy Gobel. Uh, today, I am presenting my third public seminar entitled uh, Towards Autonomous Vehicles 2.0, Unifying Vision, Language and Action for embodied AI, within embodied AI for safe and uh, explainable autonomous driving. Yeah, in this project, I am working with uh, Dr. Mohamed Asami from Huawei, Canada, and also Professor Randy is my supervisor. Yes, sure. what I did to it when I touched it. Oh, nice. <laughs> This is where you had it when we were practicing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Cool. Thank you. So this is a brief agenda of my presentation. I will first talk about how autonomous driving architectures have evolved over the time. For example, how it was in 1980s how it, it, it was in 2000s and how it is becoming, like kind of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Then I will talk about two main paradigms in autonomous driving, which are modular pipeline and end-to-end -end learning pipeline. And furthermore, I will introduce the concept of autonomous vehicle 2.0 and the safety and the explainability challenge within, uh, the in the realm of autonomous driving. And furthermore, I will present some insights from my recent experimental studies and conclude the presentation. So, history of uh, contemporary autonomous driving goes to uh, 1989, where Carnegie Mellon University was able to drive autonomous cars in an end-to-end -end way uh, using kind of uh, lidar and the camera sensors. And what they did is they kind of collected a uh, thousand and a two hundred uh, road image and each presented four times and they, they they developed a simple neural network architecture with three layer back propagation network and by this way they were able to move the vehicle at the speed of 2.5 mile per hour for the road uh, following task yeah so this is kind of image of uh, first modern autonomous driving it has kind of LiDAR device equipped here, it has kind of video camera, and it has 5,000 5, watt generator. So nearly 35 years ago, autonomous driving was like this. Then uh, next kind of big kind of, uh, let us say, progress was uh, 2000, uh, happened in 2005, when uh, Stanley kind of won the DARPA Grand Challenge. So DARPA Grand Challenge kind of was a dedicated autonomous driving kind of contest where several uh, vehicles can, uh, kind of uh, competed with each other to see which one kind of con uh, completes the predefined task successfully by following the uh, predefined route. And it was kind of designed by Stanford University in US and uh, these were kind of settings that they used. So they had LiDAR, camera, GPS, and inertial sensors then they had low level models in, in their software architecture and the control actions were kind of speed, directions and decision making. And by this way, uh, it was able to complete a 212 kilometer off-road course successfully. And the Stanley won kind of uh, this DARPA Grand Challenge in 2015, which also kind of founded, uh, uh, which also founded kind of modular architecture for autonomous driving vehicles. Then in 20, uh, 2016, there was another kind of uh, breakthrough in autonomous driving. So that NVIDIA team in the United States, they were able to drive autonomous car in an end-to-end -end way, just using convolutional neural network to map kind of a raw pixels of camera to steering commands. Actually, this work was inspired by the original uh, original Alvin network, uh, which was presented in 1989. And uh, their uh, autonomous car had kind of very successful demonstration so that it was able to drive the car safety in dynamic traffic environment. And the vehicle's name was Dave 2. 
So since uh, so since 2000, so there have been two main approaches to build autonomous driving architectures in terms of is their kind of AI components. So it is modular pipeline and end-to-end -end pipeline, pipeline. So what is the difference between them? In modular pipeline, we have several interconnected kind of layers, which are perception, localization, planning, and control. For example, perception enables autonomous car to, um, to see and sense its operation environment. Localization is its ability to understand its current position. Then uh, planning is kind of, uh, kind of uh, 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 how to say, uh, finding an appropriate route to kind of, uh, to complete. And finally, control is a proper execution of the truth and actions. And by this way, autonomous car can brake, accelerate, and steer. So there are kind of four main interconnected components in modular pipeline. And when we compare to NTN pipeline, we have the single machine learning task uh, as a deep neural network. So we have here four, perception, localization, planning, and control. However, in uh, end -end, uh, autonomous driving, we have a single deep neural network, which is mainly imitation and reinforcement learning-based uh, learning mechanism. And by this way, again, autonomous car can brake, uh, accelerate, and steer. So here we can see that uh, these are kind of interconnected to each other, but here all kind of backbones are kind of shared as a single task. Then uh, there is a big kind of challenge of uh, safety explainability trade-off uh, in modular pipeline and end-to-end -end, uh, learning. For example, uh, modular pipeline is kind of more interpretable by design. Why? Because we can easily debug uh, to see uh, where error happened in this architecture. For example, we can see whether some uh, possible errors are associated with perception or localization or planning or control. So this kind of... Uh, uh, feature makes end-to-end -end autonomous driving, uh, sorry, modular autonomous driving more interpretable. On the other hand, end-to-end -end, uh, autonomous driving, it's a deep neural network, it's a black box, and it has kind of lack of interpretability, but it's considered safer and more efficient. So why it's considered more, and, uh, more efficient and safer? Because we have a single task, and it does not have kind of, uh, how to say, it does not propagate errors uh, like in modular pipeline. For example, when we have error in a modular pipeline, let us say in perception model. Then this error is propagated to localization, then from localization to planning and to, to control. By this way, we have cumulative error, which is not kind of very efficient kind of decision-making uh, strategy. However, in deep neural, uh, in uh, end, end autonomous driving, we have a single task, and that's why it's kind of considered safer and more efficient. Before you go on, just an editorial comment for audiences, both online, if you can hear me, and in the room is that uh, Tesla's autopilot first version, I think 7.0 or something, um, was announced in 2014 and delivered in 2015. And to, and to uh, place it somewhere in the spectrum, look at the bottom right diagram where you have a single end-to-end -end, um, uh, training for autonomous control, mm -hmm. very weak autonomous control. And the only input is camera. There's no leader and there's no radar. And that remains the case today. Elon Musk has said, oh, no, we're not going to put leader or radar on any of our cars. Yeah, exactly. Because he doesn't make enough money if he does that. Anyway, yeah. that, that gives you some context of where um, um, one of the best known, publicly best known autonomous controllers come. And in 2015, all it could do was road following. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Exactly. And it doesn't do much better today, as you'll probably point out. Yeah, thanks for this, my friend. Uh, so now we know that, okay, there are two main paradigms to build autonomous driving systems, which are modular pipeline and end-to-end -end learning. But which one to choose? And what is the kind of industrial perspective on this opinion? So in the, when, we, when we talk about autonomous driving, the first thing that comes to our mind is kind of safety. So as autonomous driving is a kind of safety critical application of AI, we can definitely say safety first, then explainability next. So in this regard, as we said, end-to-end -end learning, it's kind of safer. It's considered safer than modular uh, pipeline. However, it lacks explainability. So we have trade-off here. Which one to choose? 
end-to-end -end learning or a model the pipeline. So given that end-to-end -end learning is kind of safer, so somehow we need to develop explainability approach for end-to-end -end autonomous driving. So if you ask questions, how to achieve human interpretable explanations with an end -to -end autonomous driving, uh, the potential answer is that we can incorporate vision language models into end-to-end -end autonomous driving, which will map real-time vision to real-time explanations. And how it happens, I will show you just one uh, quick example. Here we have video. So this autonomous driving architecture is called a uh, Lingo One. It was introduced by a wave team in uh, London, UK. So what they do is they incorporate uh, vision language models to their autonomous driving architecture to present real-time explanations on real-time actions. For example, here we have zebra crossing. And you see as autonomous car approaches here, it sees that there are pedestrians crossing the road. And it says, okay, stopping because there are pedestrians crossing and provides further explanation like remaining stop at the zebra crossing. And once the uh, crossing is cleared, it continues to drive and presents relevant explanation as well. So this is a kind of typical example of uh, vision language explanation for autonomous driving in an end-to-end -end manner. So given that vision language models are now becoming more popular, especially because of the transformer models and the since introduction of um, GPT, chat GPT like uh, language models, there is also kind of new paradigm in autonomous driving architectures as well. And this paradigm is termed as autonomous vehicle 2.0. And actually this was first introduced by wave and the lift, I mean, from industrial perspective. And what, what are some key features of our autonomous vehicle 2.0 is that so it unifies vision language and action with an embodied AI. So embodied AI means that physically uh, an agent interacts with the environment and makes decisions based on this interaction. And based on this kind of characteristic, it eliminates the need for high definition maps because high definition maps are usually a computational cost kind of resources to use for decision-making process of autonomous cars. However, embodied AI has a big promise that we can eliminate the need for high definition maps in end-to-end -end autonomous driving with an embodied AI. And furthermore, it has kind of data-driven generalization, which also enables scalability. And finally, autonomous vehicle 2.0 is kind of designed to meet uh, safety and the interpretability requirements at its core. So concept looks good and also promising and probably people like such kind of concept. However, there are several challenges with autonomous vehicle 2.0. So there is kind of famous paper, which was kind of uh, published by Google, Stanford University, University of California, Berkeley, and OpenAI. And they list five problems in real time and real world AI systems, entitled concrete problems in AI safety. And these problems are avoiding negative uh, side effects, avoiding reward hacking, scalable oversight, safe exploration, and robustness to distributional shift. And given that autonomous driving is about real-time decision-making, these problems, of course, also apply to autonomous vehicle 2.0. So first problem, avoiding negative side effects. So usually in simulation environments, when we kind of, uh, when we try to control autonomous car, we first try to make sure that autonomous car makes a safe decision by, for itself. So it does not touch kind of any, uh, how to say, uh, static and the dynamic objects uh, uh, around uh, on the road. And in, in many cases, we do not think, for example, whether such a decision of autonomous car hinders decision-making ability of other, let's say, other cars. So it means that 
as a part of uh, vehicle to vehicle communication, we should ensure that autonomous driving, autonomous car does not only make a safe decision for itself, but all the kind of, it ensures that it does not cause any uh, kind of crash or problem for other vehicles as well, which is kind of operated by real humans. So one potential solution uh, for uh, this problem is uh, to develop, for example, sympathetic cooperative driving. Actually, this was introduced by Stanford researchers. They said that we should train agents not only to achieve safe driving for autonomous cars, but for, but for all the human controlled vehicles as well. And this is called sympathetic cooperative driving, one of the preliminary works in this kind of topic. Then uh, the second problem, avoiding uh, reward hacking. For example, autonomous cars, they can use different uh, different reward function and dynamic reward functions. For example, it's possible that at some point they will have maybe a little bit static environment and they will apply certain reward functions. However, when autonomous car goes to a more complex environment, more complex environment will need definitely adjusted uh, or <coughs> revised reward function. So we should ensure that dynamic reward functions considers both a static and the dynamic environments accordingly and the enable autonomous car to make safe decisions. Then the third problem is scalable oversight. It means that when it's about end-to-end -end autonomous driving, at some point, it can go away from sight. For example, let us say there is a big tunnel and autonomous car moves inside that, and possibly we do not have con control over the actions of autonomous car at the tunnel. And can we measure that, for example, uh, autonomous car at that situation will drive safely because it's also kind of uh, out of human override. So this is called scalable oversight problem. Uh, then here comes safe exploration. For example, at some specific point, autonomous car can have uh, options uh, to, to, select, uh, to select several routes uh, as an alternative. However, for example, let us say it makes a decision and it goes to one way. However, uh, that, that one is not kind of uh, pre-planned. It just changes it because it thinks that it can save time. However, uh, while uh, kind of saving time, it can go into kind of dangerous environment, which has kind of damaged the infrastructures, such as potholes or bad asphalts and so on. So autonomous cars should always explore safely all options and they make kind of safe decisions accordingly. And finally, a well-known issue is a uh, robustness to distributional shift. It means that when we tra train autonomous car on sim a simulation environment, we said, okay, it's good, it moves safely, it does not touch any static or dynamic ob objects along the road, so are not deployed to real vehicles. However, sensor, sensor uh, model of the simulation may be different from sensor model of the real world. So they made always these kind of safety gaps in this concept. That's why it also needs kind of additional investigations to kind of bridge the gap between simulation and the physical environments. Then here comes explainability challenge. So what are some possible explainability challenge with autonomous vehicle 2.0? Here, first one is time granularity of explanations. Let us say autonomous car delivers explanations in real time. However, there are some subtle nuances here. For example, when explanations should be delivered, before action is taken, or before action is decided, or after action is taken, or how many seconds are needed kind of to convey explanations to people on board. So this was this is kind of one of the challenge. The second one is robustness of interactive explanations. So interactive explanations are becoming more popular in the realm of autonomous driving, so that as a passengers or people on board, you can have a talk with autonomous car. For example, when autonomous car makes a specific decision, let us say it turns right. You ask car, hey car, why are you turning to the right? And by this way, human machine interface of autonomous car should present you a human interpretable explanation, like I am turning right because, for example, traffic light allows me to turn right. So this is kind of uh, interactive explanation. However, there are some robustness related challenges which, uh, which I will show in my experiment. And all the third important thing is that people may have different functional and cognitive abilities on understanding and react to explanations. So, so for example, there may be people who just kind of prefers to receive uh, explanation in a specific human machine interface, or people may have, for example, a sight or 
mobility related problems. So they will need kind of different uh, forms and the contents of explanations in autonomous driving. So these three are kind of a key challenge uh, with, with respect to explainability in autonomous vehicle 2.0. Now I would like uh, to kind of perform uh, to show you some uh, insights from my recent experimental studies regarding the role of explanations and uh, what are some implications of exp uh, explanations in uh, autonomous driving. So I performed an experiment with a visual question answering via Lava uh, Vision Language Model on the Bakley Deep Driving uh, Bakley Deep Drive Attention Dataset. So what I did is. I selected five traffic scenarios, which are kind of dynamic and critical. And when autonomous car makes a decision here, I ask it to justify its action. For example, if you look at the first, um, first scene here, autonomous car, uh, autonomous car moves straight. And then I say, briefly explain why the car is going straight in the scene to the human machine interface, it says, the car is going straight because it's following the traffic light signals, which are green for the car at this moment. So this is a correct explanation. So I have kind of action, and I ask kind of action reflected action reflecting a question for the uh, for its uh, I mean real time action, and it presents kind of correct explanation that I am going straight because the uh, traffic light enables me to go straight. However, interesting things happen here. So as a passenger. We, as a uh, kind of due to our uh, curiosity or some other reasons, sometimes we can ask incorrect questions intentionally. For example, when autonomous car, car goes straight, we say, hey car, explain why are you turning right in this scene? Where the actual decision is going straight. And it says, the car is turning right in the scene because it's following the traffic light signals, which are green for the car at the moment. So this is incorrect explanations. We see that very simple trick confuses the transformer model to present a falsified and a fictitious explanation on real-time action of autonomous car. For example, as a passenger, when I ask, uh, hey car, why are you turning right in a ghost rate scenario, it should have said that, no, actually it's not uh, turning right, it's going straight as a justification of uh, its action and uh, shows that, okay, it really understands the scene. So in all experiments, uh, when I tried with uh, other traffic scenarios as well, I saw that for the conventional questions, my uh, explanation presented by Lava Multimodal Transformer is correct. However, for human adversarial examples here, it always presented incorrect explanation. And it seems that language prior problem uh, kind of confused the Lava vision language models to present a correct explanation. So, so this is kind of, uh, yeah, vision language model justifies the driving scene correctly for conventional questions. However, it fails to present uh, correct explanations for human adversarial queries. So how does this incorrect explanation, how is this incorrect explanations aff uh, kind of uh, affect people in terms of their mental model? For example, uh, does incorrect explanation have a negative uh, impact on people's feeling of comfort and the safety per perception on, uh, via aut on autonomous driving. So to understand these nuances, I performed a simple user study to kind of know what are people's reactions to incorrect and falsified explanations. So uh, what I did is uh, I kind of, uh, we hired kind of 20 people, which are 10 males, 10 females, and age range is from 20 to 47, where average is 28.65 and standard deviation is 6.03. And I asked questions about how incorrectness of explanations affects their feeling of comfort and the safety perception for autonomous car. And uh, the research, uh, this research study was conducted under the research ethics principle of the University of Alberta. And these are some just results from uh, user study. So 14 people out of 20 said that they are uncomfortable with incorrect explanations. And if these incorrect explanations are kind of uh, persistent and regularly happen, they may even use, stop using an autonomous car. So 14 people out of uh, 20, which is around 70%. Then 
17 people out of 20, they said that incorrectness of explanations affects their safety perception of autonomous driving also negatively. So when they get negative expl uh, incorrect explanation, they say that it also affects their safety perception on autonomous car as well. And here I, uh, here I present all the second kind of uh, experimental study. Instead of kind of injecting just driving image, I also kind of uh, inject videos, real-time driving videos to my multimodal transformer where I use a video lava multimodal transformer uh, to kind of, uh, to, to the video question answering task. So here we have again, basically deep drive, and basically deep drive uh, attention data set. And here the lengths of videos are four seconds, five seconds, and again, four seconds. And in this kind of video, autonomous car performs specific actions. For example, here in the first one, uh, when, when we ask, what is the car doing once it approaches the pedestrian? And uh, the multimodal, uh, multimodal transformer summarizes the video and says that the car stops and the pedestrian crosses the street, which is correct. So I already have labels and we know what's happening in this video. And we see that video lava kind of uh, summarizes uh, this video content well and presents correct explanation. Similarly, for example, for this scenario and this scenario, it also kind of presents correct explanation. However, problem again happens in case of human adversarial queries. For example, if you look at this uh, video, so we have 20, 12 seconds of video. When I say what traffic light is observed, it says that the video shows a red traffic light on the street. Actually, there is no video traffic light. There is no red traffic light in the scene or no any traffic light in this video. However, simple kind of uh, trick question forces kind of multimodal transformer to again uh, respond in a incorrect way. And for example, here, autonomous car goes ahead in a red traffic light in this video. So if you look at here, so from time to time, it kind of moves ahead and it makes incorrect decision. And when I say, why did the car decide to move forward at the scene, it says, the car decided to move forward because the traffic light turned green, indicating that it was safe to proceed. However, traffic light uh, never turned green here. It was always uh, red in this video. However, simple again, uh, question confuses the model it, and it again presents incorrect falsified, uh, falsified explanation. So we see that we, uh, we can kind of summarize that Robustness against human adversarial questions, human adversarial queries is a big problem for even advanced uh, vision language models. I mean, they understand conventional questions very easily and present correct explanations. However, in case of uh, human adversarial examples, they present incorrect explanations, which are fictitious. So this is kind of the, one of the biggest problem with current state-of-the-art vision language or video transformers. And based on this historical perspective and based on, uh, from, based on from the yesterday, today, and tomorrow, this is my personal perspective on how autonomous vehicle uh, 2.0 will be shaped and what's its difference with, uh, from autonomous vehicle 1.0. So autonomous vehicle 1.0 mainly consists of a, pipe, a modular pipeline and there was low interpretability consideration. And there was, uh, there was low scalability so that we were not able to measure kind of um, decision-making of autonomous car in quantitative ways. And there were also kind of low human, uh, human in the loop aspect. And they did not consider fail-safe ability as well. For example, fail-safe is ab ability that when it's out of human override, autonomous car kind of, uh, how to say, uh, sees that there's uh, there is dangerous situation, and instead of, for example, making some random decisions, it should stop and uh, kind of continue its journey after it sees that situation becomes better. However, in autonomous vehicle 1.0, we did not have kind of focus on fail service ability as well. On the other side, autonomous vehicle 2.0 has big has better promises. Where pipeline design is uh, supposed to be end to end, 
says high interpretability consideration, improvement methodology is adaptive, says high scalability, says high human in the loop aspect, and the fail safe ability is taken into consideration. Another editorial comment for the audience who might not be familiar with this, and, and mostly I say this because we're so brainwashed by the branding hype and marketing of uh, companies like Tesla uh, and Cruz from General Motors, is that the notion of a human interacting with a semi-autonomous vehicle and the research regarding human uh, autonomous vehicle interaction is started 15 years ago, at least 15 years ago. Um, and it started not surprisingly um, in German research labs. Um, I suspect uh, there are more inscrutable but less uh, transparent versions um, of other big uh, manufacturing nation in Japan and emerging in China. But the point is, is that the big manufacturers who understood the increase in um, functionality of semi-automatic behavior of vehicles also understood that that trajectory um, might not be one that Tesla convinces you about. Just let us work out the technical details and tomorrow you'll be able to buy a fully autonomous vehicle. Um, that from the place I come from in the prairies is good old fashioned bullshit. Um, and you have to keep that in mind is because the people who lead the automotive research industry in the world are not the Americans. And, and the ones that do already suspect this gradual change of increased autonomy, but um, increased sophistication of interaction with humans participating, uh, just like you're talking to your EV driver. Anyway, that, that I found to be most important because this kind of work has to, to be able to get public credibility, be put in that context and, and dispense and dissolve some of the marketing things. Yeah, and here are some conclusions from uh, the presentation. So we can say that autonomous vehicle 2.0 is a big promise. However, it should kind of overcome uh, concrete problems in AI safety. And we should be very careful, as Professor Rand said, we should be very careful to say that, okay, we have full autonomous driving cars and they are fully safe and they will kind of make uh, safe decisions all the time. We haven't still achieved it yet, and yet it seems very difficult and ambitious, and I am not personally very sure if we can achieve full autonomous driving, which is very difficult. And such autonomous driving architectures should at least overcome these uh, kind of concrete problems in AI safety. And then, uh, as I specified, time granularity, robustness, and the people's different uh, cognitive and functional abilities should be considered in designing relevant human-machine interface for explanation delivery. And finally, we should also conduct more user studies to understand what are their uh, kind of needs, preferences, and the requirements in uh, kind of uh, designing and developing relevant human machine interface and the exploration delivery approach uh, within this context. So this is the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your listening and any questions are welcome. Thank you.